Welcome to this uh, webinar in the Nordic Tech webinar, uh, webinar series. So my name is Christian and uh, today's webinar is focused on uh, our NRF, NRF 9160 and how it can help enable cellular IoT asset tracking. So uh, I'm uh, the product manager for cellular IoT um, in Nordic Semiconductor and uh, based in uh, Trondheim, Norway. So a few practicalities before we start with the webinar itself. So including Q&A, we uh, get probably keep it going for around 60 minutes. That's my experience because there is questions at the end. So please, we encourage you to ask questions. On the top right, uh, top right side, you have a sidebar where you can ask questions. So if you ask it here, it's uh, anonymous and we can go through as many as we have time for in the end. But uh, please try to keep them relevant for the topic so that uh, we can go through as many relevant questions as possible. Also want to make you aware that questions related to roadmap and future features will not be commented in a public webinar like this. So keep it focused to the content. The chat is not anonymous. So if you use this one, we will not be able to collect the questions uh, in a sheet and uh, please use the, the top bar. There could be questions we don't answer today due to time or relevance. Then we have a dev zone where we have a huge technical support team or more than 40 people supporting all of you. So you go there and ask questions, they will get back to all of you. We will also do a webinar afterwards. So if you have friends or colleagues who can't be here today, you can send them a recording of the webinar and you have the ability to, to look at some details afterwards if you need. Today, we're gonna start with a short overview on asset tracking from a cellular connectivity perspective, of course then focus on um, the 9160 and how that is optimized for asset tracking applications and, and why. I'm going to spend most of the time focusing on the positioning features, since that's crucial for asset tracking, and then on some uh, new improvements and features we have on the low power side, since this also is crucial to, to get the battery life that you need for these applications. In the end, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about development tools and how you can get started with your own asset tracker design before I, I summarize the key points for you. So you hopefully remember uh, the key things after today. So before I go into details on asset tracking itself, short uh, refresh <coughs> meant on people's memory on how the low power wide area network landscape looked like, because this is uh, somewhat relevant to what we're gonna talk about today, because uh, you all are familiar with the cellular technology in the sense that you have a cell phone on 5G and a 4G and maybe even soon 5G standard technology. And uh, these are the traditional and the uh, technology has been there for a long time. And uh, 2G is what we had on the cell phone in the past. And it's used today in quite a lot of machine to machine type applications that was developed a few years back. But 2G is not very low power. It's also being turned off and uh, removed now in many places in the world uh, because 5G is being rolled out and the frequencies and uh, bandwidth in the backhaul is needed for 5G and uh, the operators, they want their business on 5G and they see declining business on, on 2G. So from that perspective, it's also not attractive anymore in addition to power. If you look at what exists for low power, we have a set of technologies referred to as sub gigahertz, which has been there for a long time. These are very constrained on bandwidth usually. They don't, they also uh, don't uh, have a common standard and they are unlicensed. That means that you cannot deploy products uh, anywhere in the world and find a network that support this technology. You have to build it somewhere where you know there is network infrastructure or you have to build your own infrastructure to deploy devices. So then that gives you the segue into why cellular IoT were developed. So it consists of an LTM1 standard and narrowband IoT standard. And these build on the existing cellular infrastructure that exists in the world. So it's fully open standard and existing infrastructure. You don't have to build your own, of course, with that. And it gives you the scalability that you need, security and reliability that you need and the quality of service that you need when you're deploying products. In some cases on a global scale and out in the field, you can't go and service these products yourself anytime. You need to really 
have high reliability network and ensure that you can operate to the right quality of service. And this is where Nordic has their seller IoT products today. And then if we jump into uh, some examples on asset tracking and how we define that in this context. So today you can go and you can buy uh, really, really small tracker tags that you can put on your keys, for example, to locate your keys uh, when you, where you or your kids have left them in the house. But this is short range wireless technology. So you need to have a gateway, you need to have a cell phone, you need to have something close to the device to understand where it is. But with cellular, things are very different because you use the existing 4G and cellular infrastructure in the world. You can deploy products basically anywhere and uh, you can track things as they go outdoor in regional basis, continent basis, even worldwide basis. So this is attractive for shipping for packets because you can track them on the route. You can discover if they are stolen. Uh, if they are lost, you can see what happened to them. And if you put sensors in your asset tracker, you can uh, monitor environmental data, product health, the physical handling of the package, and you can do optimized fleet management. So that if you do have a, a set of product where you actually optimize um, how you send them out to customer how, when they are returned and how you should do that life cycle with product. You can also do that. In retail, we see a mix of, or in consumer and retail, we see a mix of product, but typically where you actually want to control that no one steals your valuables. It could be scooters, it could be expensive bicycles, and it could be other things. But we also see, uh, especially in the rent rental area, you can do fleet management. You can put up geofences so that you can uh, with a geofence using um, GPS and other location technologies actually control whether a device is uh, used uh, inside the area that you plan to. And you can do this location on demand type of tracker. So you can build with seller also now fairly small uh, tracker tags that you can put on your keys and other valuables and you can locate it also if they're lost outdoor and uh, when you're tracking and tracking and things like that. Also in the health service, we see uh, tracking becoming uh, interesting on the cellular with cellular connectivity. So with cellular connectivity, you can basically deploy health products into peop to people that uh, are not capable of handling uh, cell phones, so they don't can afford cell phones, they cannot install apps, they cannot manage a lot of credentials and things like that. You can build product that directly connect to the cloud to send data to nurses or to health personnel. So here also it's possible to track people's location, ensure that they reside in a area they're supposed to be. You can also put in sensors, a lot of sensors of course, so that you can actually control their health, their movement, you can do fall detection and you can other things without relying on that person being indoor or close to a cell phone or an expensive gateway. <clears throat> and then you have livestock and pets. It can be certainly interesting to know where your pet is in a simple way. And for livestock, control location, use geofence and control animal health. So if an if a animal stop moving, for example, you can quickly go out there and check that everything is okay. And last, I want to mention um, construction machinery and heavy equipment. So I think in the US alone, if you look at the uh, theft of heavy machinery, it's worth around $300 million every year because uh, these are usually placed um, remotely or it can be on construction sites where there's limited surveillance. So even if they have locks, so steering wheel locks, steering wheel locks, it's quite easy to break in and steal them. And they are usually stolen near near or in states where you have harbors, so they ship them uh, out of the country quickly. So if you could put a tracker on these that are uh, simple to install, and low power and small, and uh, quite e difficult to uh, detach without uh, any sensors. Uh, calling for an alarm, you can predict, the, <clears throat> you can see probably and, and prevent a lot of theft. You can also control the usage by putting up geofences and things like that. If you have location support and you have seller connectivity, so you can basically put these products out anywhere and control their location. 
So there's lots of good use cases for seller IoT asset tracking and lots of, of challenges that you can help to solve with that. So still, this is kind of in the start phase, I would say, in terms of deployment. So why is that? Why is not everything tracked when uh, there is such a good cases for it? So the reason for that up to today is that uh, it's not trivial to build this type of asset tracker. When you're making a cellular product, you need um, a modem, you need a microcontroller that can run the application and all the sensors. You need antennas, you need SIM cards, and you need a lot of software to put all of this together. You need connectivity and perhaps you want a cloud solution so that you can uh, get access to aggregated data and visualize everything. And uh, when you've done all this, you need to make it run for years because uh, asset tracking is about building something that is small, can run from small battery and perhaps can operate for years before it is discharged or before you have to uh, change it. Or maybe you want to build a really, really small tracker uh, pad with uh, cellular, so you have a really small battery, but you don't want the customer to recharge it every day. You want to recharge every month or every year, so you really have to optimize. If you compare cellular to, um, should we say, traditional short-range technologies used for asset tracking, such as Bluetooth Low Energy, the difference is also that in cellular, the network are in control of a lot of parameters. So inherently, you don't have full control on how much power the modem will use because it's a network that decides some of the parameters that is used when you transmit data. When you're trying to build this into a really, really small package so it can fit into the application, it's a big challenge. And uh, lastly, how do you put all this together and who do you ask for support when you want to build those together, have questions? You have pieces from a lot of different places and uh, you need to find support in a simple way. Once you start deploy, there is certification requirements. And uh, certainly if you're building global products, you need to make sure that it works globally. So there's a lot of things to take care of when building a cellular tracker. And today on the 9160, I'm gonna walk through some of the things that we have done that can be helpful in that and how we have tried to tackle these challenges to enable cellular IoT asset tracking on a bigger scale than is done today. So our NR9160 is a really highly integrated device, meaning that you get a lot or what you're looking for when you uh, use that device. And we have built st very strong connectivity partners. So uh, if you get in touch with Nordic, we can guide you to what connectivity partners you should look for, uh, depending on where you want to deploy your products in the world. We built everything from scratch because we knew from day one that we needed low power to address uh, asset tracking and other seller, app uh, seller application. And um, we have a business model that means we want to sell to um, basically anyone who wants to build a seller product. We want to follow the same business model as we have so very successfully done with Bluetooth Low Energy, where we have 40% market share. So we are focusing a lot of ease of use on how you can really create a very diverse set of asset tracking applications in a simple way. So if we uh, jump into the 9160 integration and what we have there quickly. This is uh, something we have talked about in earlier webinars as well. So I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but here you basically have a small system in package, 10 by 16 millimeter in size. <clears throat> Inside you have a multiband modem that supports both LTEM and narrowband IoT, and it's included a GPS. So you have location technology on board on this SOC. In addition, there's a Cortex M33 MCU so that you can run your application inside as well. You don't need any external MCU to get rid of that component if you integrate everything on the system in package. And we also included PMIX and other details. So if you look inside the system in package, you have the chipset from Nordic with the modem and the application processor. And outside the chipset, you have PMIX, RF front end, crystals and passives and other things that you need. So in total, you have basically everything you need here. You need to connect some deep decoupling capacitors and power, and then you have a, a full cellular system on chip uh, up and running. It's really low power down to uh, 18 microamp average when you use uh, 82 second EDRX sleep and multiband support so that you can uh, have global coverage with this product. And we have pre-certified it so that 
when you build a seller device, you don't have to do any certification on top of the end product certification that you need to do in some parts of the world. If you look beyond the chipset and what the device can do, we have worked very close with our partner Corvo to build a really optimized front end. So we support up to 23 dBm max output power, which is the highest that you are allowed to do in cellular network for LTM1 and narrowband. This is really useful because uh, when you can use more power, you can transmit data quicker if you are uh, in areas where there is uh, poor coverage. That is much more power efficient than using less power and then in ending up with uh, a lot of repetitions to get the data through. And this is really stable. So we are fully 3GPP compliant from minus 40 to 85 degree. So we can support as a tracker that operate in the coldest regions of the world and in the warmest regions of the world. The packaging is also uh, plated metal and uh, internal component covered by molding. So this is a package that is very robust against corrosive environments. And because uh, all components are completely covered, you can do molding of this system in package with all commonly used molding materials without any problems. So you can also here create a, a, a product that is very robust for harsh environment or for harsh handling. If you look at the certification side, which is important if you either deploy globally or, or locally, we have a regulatory certified in 9160 for all the major parts of the world. And we are now in the process of certifying also in Brazil. So we target to have that done by end of the year. And uh, the 9160 support all the common bands that is used across the world. And in addition to regional certifications, we have PTCRB and GCF certifications, which are global certifications. If you go to our webpage, you can also get more detailed view on both regulatory certification, but also which network operator certifications that we have now completed, which is uh, becoming more or less a similar map for us today. So all in all, if you look at the application circuit of the 9160, this is really uh, what you're looking for when you're building an asset tracker. You have a really highly integrated system and package where you have a modem and you can connect antennas for communication and, and GPS. And then you have the application processor, Cortex-M33 processor, one megabyte of memory and peripherals so that you can uh, process data and you can connect sensors to do different type of health monitoring, environmental, environmental monitoring, package handling monitoring and things like that. And together with SIM card and a battery, you have everything you need to actually have a complete application circuit. All this can be done on a four layer PCB and uh, you need a few decoupling capacitors in addition to what we have integrated on the system and package to make everything run properly. So it's really simple to build a complete application circuit based on, on the NF 9160. So today I'm not gonna talk a lot of details on everything here. We have covered some of that in our previous webinars. I'm gonna focus on, on low power and, uh, and GPS and positioning. So we'll continue and uh, jump straight into the topic of, of GPS. <clears throat> so I assume that GPS is familiar to all of you. So what you need to be aware of in principle, if you look at GPS from, should we say uh, power perspective is that Standard GPS devices, they typically download position data from satellites, um, almanac data and uh, ephemeris data, which have, uh, are valid for various uh, amount of time, depending on what data is downloaded. When you download data from a GPS, it's uh, going over 50 bits per second. So it's a really low bandwidth interface. This means that when you need to download some position data in order to get fix, that can take a long time. So this gets quite painful for typical asset tracker devices because they tend to sleep for a long time. You do not track everything on a continuous basis. If you're tracking a packet that's being sent across the USA, maybe you wake up a few times every day just to ensure that you are on the right track, that you don't, it's not deviating off what you have uh, planned for and then there's no 
visibility that is being lost or stolen or things like that. But when you start to sleep and you wake up after some time, the ephemeris or the analog data can be outdated. So you need to download that again. And that can take, should we say, anywhere from half a minute up to many minutes, depending on how long you have been sleeping. So even if you don't need very fast fix, you wake up five times a day to get location. You don't really care exactly what that is. But when you need a lot of time to download this data, this also have a power impact on your application. So this is why assisted GPS exists. And we support assisted GPS on the NRF9160. So uh, when you do uh, assisted GPS, you basically download the uh, ephemeris and almanac data over LTE at a much faster bandwidth than GPS. And this is ideal for sleeping devices because even if you sleep for a long time and you have to upload, update a lot of data from the GPS, that can be done in a matter of seconds. And then you typically have time to first fix below 10 seconds, regardless of how long you have been sleeping. So when we look at this from a power perspective, it gets very interesting. The GPS, when it's on and constantly running on the 9160, uses around 40 milliamp. So this means if you have to be awake for a long time to get the first fix, you will spend relatively much more power than if you're awake only for a short time. So if you're doing what is referred to as a call start, meaning that you have to get both uh, ferries but also some almanac data, you can actually use many minutes to get all, that data, all those data from the satellite, and you can end up sp spending several milliampere hours before you have the first position and know where the device is. And even if you are uh, doing what we refer to as warm start, meaning that you have slept for a few cycles, you can end up spending almost half milliamp hour hour just to get first fix. And you see that this impacts the battery lifetime of your product, but it also gives you some unpredictability because you are not exactly sure how much power you will get, it will use to get the first fix, when uh, that may depend a lot on how long you're sleeping. So if you then look at assisted GPS, what you then do is that you download the GPS data over LTE. So in the solution that we have on the NRF9160, that's around three kilobyte of data that you can download from our NRF cloud solution. And that is typically done Less than half a second, this is even a bit conservative, with an average current of around 50 milliamp. And you can see that the estimated power or current usage is really, really small compared to turning on the GPS. So when you do this, then uh, you typically uh, end up having a much more predictable power usage when turning on the GPS. And it's always much, much lower than if you have to actually stay and search for satellites for a long time. So even if you don't actually need a very fast time to first fix, assisted GPS is very, very useful to get much lower power and much more predictable power consumption in your application. And the NRF cloud assisted location solution that I mentioned, that works by the device sending uh, some data to the cloud. Then the data will send the ephemeris and the ELMLEC data down to the device in a packed, really packed and really small format. And then the, dev, the application running on the application side of the 9160 can uh, push this data into the modem. And then the modem will use that to uh, get and resolve the location. So all this is available today. And uh, in uh, our SDK that I will talk about later, this is complete with source code and an example on how you can use that. We also support another um, lo assisted location uh, protocol called SUPL. This is really optimized and used in cell phones today. So the reason I don't have any detail on that is because uh, to use SUPL, you have to download probably more than double the amount of data because it's not packed very efficient. So it's not as efficient as using the solution that we have developed. We have also recently done a new release of the modem firmware, 
that has some GPS enhancements that uh, can be very useful for asset tracking. We have introduced um, a lower resolution mode where you can actually trade resolution uh, for a faster time to fix and a 2D positioning mode. So typically when you, or when you work with GPS, you need four satellites uh, that the device can see in order to get a fix or resolve a position. But it's possible to do it all, only with three satellites when there is very limited view. But then <clears throat> you don't get the, the altitude resolution, you just get the position. And this is uh, something that could be useful in places where you don't really have open sky. So it can be urban canyons where you have a lot of high rise buildings around you, but also very hilly landscape. And here it can be challenging sometimes to get a good view of four strong satellites. So with the 2D positioning mode, the NRF9160 will still resolve a position if only three satellites are visible. So when you don't get altitude with 2D positioning, it means that when you are close to sea level, the accuracy is still very close to the real accuracy you have with four satellites and what we refer to as 3D positioning. But when you go up in altitude, so higher above sea level, then the inaccuracy will increase. So if you look at two examples, um, Trondheim, where we have the Nordic headquarter, it resides uh, roughly at sea level. So here 2D fix will be very accurate because uh, the device will not take any altitude information into account. And you are in the same situation in most of the big cities around the world. They reside at sea level. So even if you only use 2D to reside position, you will get very accurate position because you are roughly at sea level. If you then travel quickly to Mexico City, you have a different situation. There are some places in the world that are high above sea level, but still you have the situation that 2D could be very interesting because you have a limited field of view. So at 2,200 meter above sea level, the 2D inaccuracy will uh, be much bigger than at sea level. So we can say a, ru a, a rough rule of thumb could be that inaccuracy is uh, the square root of the altitude. So that means uh, roughly 50 meter in this example, but it's hard to predict exactly, but it also, it also depends on what's the signal strength from the satellite. Are the satellites you look at close together or are they far apart? That will also impact, so there's a lot of parameters. So this is just to give you some guidance to what you can expect. But it means basically that you cannot resolve which side of the road the device is, but you can decide uh, which quarter uh, or block it is and uh, on roughly which road. But to help on this case, it's also possible for the application that runs inside the NRF9160 to inject the altitude to the GPS if you know the altitude roughly from the application side. Then you remove this error completely and you can have really high accuracy with 2D in addition to, to 3D. So when looking at how you can really do that, it brings me on to the next uh, location uh, example I want to bring, and that is Helder-based location. So before we go into that, let me just quickly remind everyone about what we mean when we talk about LTE cells. So um, a base station that we usually refer it by is uh, by the right technology called um, an E node B. And uh, each of these E node B, they have an area range and this range we refer to as a cell. And all the devices that are inside such a cell, we uh, formally referred to as um, user equipment. So when a user equipment or a device is connected to the cellular network, it always connects to one of these E nodes B. And uh, the good thing about this is that for most of the networks, we know fairly exact where these E node Bs are located. So it's possible based on the connection to resolve roughly where you are. So if you look at this and how we have done it today on the 9160, what we refer to as a single cell location. This is really optimized for embedded devices that are constrained and need to use very limited amount of power. So uh, when the device is connected to the network, it basically sends the ID of this E B to the cloud. Then the cloud have a database with the location 
of all this E node B. So it can actually, in almost zero time, resides the location of this E node B and then the rough location by this device or user equipment. But because these cells can be quite big, so um, they are relatively smaller in heavy populated area because you need to support a lot of user equipment, but they are, can be quite big in rural or areas with limited amount of people. So you can say that on typical basis here, you get kilometer accuracy instead of meter accuracy, or you can understand as in this picture, roughly which part of the city you are based on which cell tower you are connected to. So you don't get the accuracy of the GPS, but the good thing about this is that it doesn't add anything to your power consumption. So when you connect to the network to send any data, if you also send the cell ID, you can actually resolve in the cloud directly a rough location of your asset. The other thing which is good with this is that it also works indoor in addition to outdoor. You don't get accurate indoor location, of course, but if something moves indoor and stays indoor for some time, you can actually resolve and confirm that the asset is still in the same location. And you can then use this to decide if you want to start more accurate tracking, or as in the example on Mexico City, if you know from this that you are in Mexico City, you can actually inject the height into the GPS and start to get accurate positioning, even though the GPS is only able to reside, resolve 2D positioning. So if you look at this together, how can you combine GPS and cellular? So cellular location is really means that you don't have any additional wasted power to get location. So you can get a course location and do course tracking or do a course geofence without any additional power consumption. You don't lose track of anything as they go indoor because you don't know exactly where it is, but you know it's there and it resides in the same cell. And as I mentioned, you can then support a GPS with cellular-based location because you can reside roughly where you are and then eject the altitude so that you can uh, improve the accuracy if the GPS is down to 2D. So in this uh, example, you uh, have a packet traveling around the road into Trondheim. And uh, all the time you just use cellular-based location because you want to really save power. So then you basically resolve the location of the cell tower or the E node B that the device connect to. So you do get a quite, uh, you know, a few dots here and there with location, but you can, you can see that what you're trying to, to ship is roughly following the course that you expect. And then when you get closer to the destination, you can choose to turn on GPS to get really accurate tracking to ensure that this ends up at the right address in the right building, for example. And by doing this, you can save a lot of power compared to waking up and trying to get GPS fixes on a regular basis. It's really a good way to combine two location technologies and not pay in power consumption for high accuracy when you don't need it. And on the 9160, we, we constantly improve on the hardware side and on the software side to try and squeeze more battery life out of the solution. So if you look at the chipset itself that we built from Nordic, we did, did build everything from scratch to try and save power. We integrated the memories and everything using one low leakage technology. So everything is embedded on board. You don't have any external memories or any high speed buses that you need to connect to upload the application data and so on to really save power. And uh, <clears throat> we have used a very low leakage processing. And um, when we decide the uh, modem, we decided early on that we only gonna support LTE M1 and narrowband IoT and don't have any 2G fallback, for example. And by doing that, we uh, took away some complexity in design. We took away some um, higher power PAs and front end that you need to have for 2G. So we can really squeeze as much as possible uh, on the low power side. And we continue to improve this, uh, both on the hardware side and the software side, because we know that for most asset tracker application, this is really, really important. And when we integrate the application processor, together with the modem on the same SOC, we are also able to offer a very tight interface between the modem and the application, so that on the application side, you can optimize uh, what you do better for uh, 
any network parameter that you need to take a, a care of to minimize the power consumption. For example, understanding the network environment so that you don't send data if you don't really have a good connection and you wait to send data until the conditions improve. We can also help you. So if you have a particular case that is very important for you, we are uh, offering support the customer to do very dedicated power measurements or help you to set up the power measurements that you have to do to really understand and, and benchmark which battery lifetime you can plan with for, for your application. We have uh, recently introduced uh, what we refer to as a revision two of the NRF 9160. So here we have uh, done some hardware improvement on the power management side to improve power consumption compared to the a revision one that's uh, being available up to now. And uh, that means that we have really lowered the power consumption uh, quite a bit on the sleep modes compared to what we had. So uh, the PSM floor current on the 9160 is now below three microamp. So we have dropped it almost 30% from the four microamp that we had before. And on this power budget, you have a, a fully retained RAM in the modem and you have a fully retained RAM and IO with RTC running on the application side. So this means that the power you need to boot up is really small and that you can boot up very quick. So if you have a sensor that starts to trigger and send data to the MCU, you can wake up very quickly to start to handle that data. You don't need to reboot anything yeah, because everything is retained. And then if you look at uh, RCC mode for M1 and EDRX, uh, we have also reduced the average EDRX current by 15 to 20%. So we are down to 18 microamp uh, at 82 second EDRX cycles, and we are down to six microamp average in a 10 minute EDRX cycle. So that means that our floor EDRX current now is below six microamp if you sleep for 10 minutes or more. We've also improved a lot on the uplink side. So uh, especially on the mid bands, uh, we have improved uh, the power efficiency of the output by around 15%. So this shows you what we have done on the M1, but uh, the improvements are similar for Narrowband IoT. And uh, the product specification for the 9160 revision two is now available on our web pages. So there you can go and read all the details on what these improvements are and uh, how it is for other settings and other parameters and also for narrowband IoT. So hopefully that's gonna be a, a real improvement that uh, a lot of you can start to take care of. And as you see, especially if you have an application that spend most of the time sleeping, this can easily improve your battery lifetime by 10 to 20%. We have also recently um, launched an online power profiler. So without writing a single line of code or putting up, setting up any hardware and doing any real measurements, you can actually estimate battery lifetime now for your solution in a predictable way. So this is a online profiler where you can plug in um, your typical settings that you expect to have, which technology you want to use, uh, LTM1 or narrowband, which PSM cycles you have, which EDRX cycles you have, how much data you're gonna send each time you wake up, uh, what paging time windows you have and so forth. So when you do that, you get a full power profile out that is based on real measurements that we have done. And we'll also give you some statistics. What is the total charge, total power that they've used? What's the PSM floor current and what the average current in the cycle of sleep and data transmission that you have set up. We are currently revising this to be updated for the revision two of the hardware so that uh, that will be available shortly. And we're also adding some more features. We're also adding more specific network parameters. So you can actually get the parameters on various networks such as uh, Verizon to actually see how much different network settings impact the power consumption of your solution. So that's something I really would like all of you to try, and uh, that gives your first estimate on what an asset tracker solution around the 9160 can mean for you in terms of power consumption. Another thing that we want to uh, talk about when the 9160 is that when you have the application processor on board and can include your application here, you should really take advantage on that and try and do edge computing. The reason for doing edge computing is twofold, really. So 
if you can compute and do some decision making on the edge, you have to send less data to the cloud and then you can save some subscription fee data. But also very important for asset tracking application is that sending data over cellular network is pretty power hungry. So uh, when you process it locally instead, you use as much less power. So on the NRF9160, sending or receiving data over LTE network is 50 to 60 milliamp on average for a total cycle. Well, if you process data at 64 megahertz on the Cortex M33, you're using three milliamp. So you're basically using almost 20 times less energy. This means in practice that you can actually spend a lot of time on the processor here to try and uh, optimize or pack your data or do clever decision making so that you're sending less data to the cloud because you will, uh, regardless of how much time you spend, save a lot of power instead of sending everything to the cloud. So uh, you shouldn't think that for an asset tracker application that cloud computing is the only solution and by sending everything to the cloud, you can do a lot of smart decisions. You can also uh, do uh, some smart decisions on the edge and use that to save a lot of power. So if you look at a simple example that if you have an accelerometer, this continuously pushes out, you know, worst case, uh, three axes with 16 bit values and it's a lot of data. But that data doesn't contain a lot of information. You need to crunch some data here to understand what's going on. And if you do that in a device, based on uh, some rules so that you understand that, okay, now the packet fell over sideways, it's laying flat, so maybe it's being handled in a harsh way. You actually just have to send one byte of information to the cloud. So make sure that you use this cleverly when you're building your application so that what you're sending is information, real information, and not just a lot of data because that's gonna burn your battery quicker. And then let's look about how you put all this together. What do we have here so that you can really build your application quick and in a reliable way? So the 9160 is not just a piece of hardware, it's really also a big piece of software. So what do you have available kind of out of the box on the 9160? On the modem side, of course, we run all the LTE stacks. We also run the IP stacks, TCP and TLS. And this is a stack that we then certify with all the big carriers so that everything here is certified and the modem is really a binary that you can yourself put into the modem or that we do in production. But if you then look at the application layer where you can write your own application inside the 9160, here we uh, have all the middleware stack options that you um, need to consider. And here we have other features such as device management, firmware already are upgrade libraries, diagnostic libraries, and so on. And on top of here, you can write your own application. So everything that resides in this application processor domain is open source. And everything here is uh, part of what we refer to as the NRF Connect SDK. So by open source, it means that you don't necessarily have to embed all of this in your application if you don't need it. You can embed only what you need to do, or you can make any changes to this as you want. If you have to use a different, different MQTT library or a different lightweight machine to machine stack or do some changes to the stack to fit your needs. So if you take a closer look at uh, the NRF Connect SDK, on the lower level, it's all the drivers and all the low level interfacing to the hardware that you need. And then we use a real-time operating system called Zephyr. So here we rely, uh, re we use the Zephyr middleware, so all the IP protocols that I mentioned, HUAP, HTTP, and so forth, are using the Zephyr. And Nordic is SDK team, and uh, we contribute heavy into the Zephyr stacks so that we can really bring uh, really good quality into these stacks as part of the solution. But on top of this, we have an application framework, and here we also make reference design and reference applications. So inside our SDK today, we actually have a full asset tracker reference application. And this shows you how to connect on uh, M1 or narrowband 
how to do FOTA, how to use the GPS, how to use assisted GPS, uh, how to use uh, cellular-based location. It also shows you how to connect and use various types of sensors that is typically used in Asset Tracker. And all of this is open source and available from GitHub so that you can download and, and get going right away. And if you look at the rest of the tool chain, uh, the SDK is, of course, very important. This is what you do to develop and put code onto the device. But we also have what we refer to NRF Connect for Desktop. So this is a tool where you install uh, the compiler, uh, the programmer to program the device, and you can have different type of monitor and trace tools. So they can also use it to debug your application. And the last piece of the puzzle is our cloud solution. So once you have built everything and you have, a, have it working, we also have a cloud solution so that you can actually connect to run your examples. Um, you can do device management, you can do SIM card management and do other things. And uh, we continue to develop this so that we now have location uh, features support, as I mentioned, and uh, we'll bring also other features onto the cloud solution in the near future. And if you look at the hardware side, we not only have the 9160, system and package. We also have some nice reference design on the hardware that you can start using. So we have a development kit, uh, but we also have this uh, kit, which is called the Thingy91, which uh, really enable you to build uh, asset tracking proof of concept in a quick way. So it's a really small uh, design, which uh, also includes a battery, uh, a rechargeable lithium ion battery, so that you can actually make it portable and you can build up as a tracking proof of concept as it is without connecting anything more. And um, here you have the 9160, of course, and you have antenna. We also have a uh, Bluetooth low energy here. Uh, and more importantly, or also important, we have uh, various types of sensors, temperature, humidity, pressure, accelerometers, uh, light sensors, and things like that. So that you have a full reference here for how you can utilize these sensors and you have an SDK and a software library with all the drivers to utilize common sensors that are used in asset tracker applications. So the software is open source, but we also have the hardware design and uh, everything here is uh, available for you so that you can use this as a starting point for your own design. But one remark I want to make to that is that it's really good to be able to reuse some of this hardware design to quickly get going in your, with your own design. But um, on, the ninth, on the thing in 91, we have a fairly complex antenna because uh, as I mentioned, we have certified this for worldwide operation. And we are also shipping the thing in 91, a single version of the thing in 91 worldwide. So this is an antenna that uh, supports a lot of bands to do that. So it's quite complex design. So uh, if you don't plan to build a real global product, but uh, maybe use a, do a regional product, so you only have to support two or three or four different bands, we really recommend that you work with your antenna manufacturer and create an antenna design that fits your application because that can simplify a lot for you. We also have different white papers on how you can integrate in 9160 and we also have white papers on how you can integrate antenna and some recommendations for antenna design so that you can ensure that when you work with your antenna manufacturers and uh, with Nordic, you have a reference for how to connect antenna properly to the 9160 and how to lay out the PCB to ensure that you have the right performance and that you have the right performance to pass any regulatory tests that you have to do as part of your application. So uh, all in all, before we, we end the webinar, as I mentioned, uh, Cellular IoT is really part of 4G networks. So this is really all in place now all over the world. And what Cellular IoT has done is to add really low power capabilities to the network. And the 9160 is certified for worldwide operation. So with a single stock keeping unit, a single part number, you can build a product based on the 9160 and ship it and uh, deploy it anywhere in the world. And we have really changed everything now because we don't only have modem and connectivity. Uh, we have positioning, but we also have the application MCU where you can develop your own application in this really small device. And uh, also a very important part of that is that all the documentation of this solution is open and uh, publicly available. And the SDK is open source and all the tools are free and publicly available. So we open up to create a big and diverse set of asset tracker applications from this. We have done everything to uh, excel in power consumption. 
So we really have a best in class power consumption today. So if what you're trying to do is to make a low power design with small battery or many years of battery life, 9160 is an ideal solution for you. Now we have this online power profiler so that you can also test what you're trying to do and what you think you need to do before you actually start any deployment. And the last thing is that we have built the hardware. So we have built a system on chip, uh, we have built a system in package, and we built all the software around it. So we have really tuned this for the best possible performance and energy efficiency. But then you also need to keep in mind that if you have any questions, it could be on the hardware, it could be on the chipset, uh, it can be on the modem, it could be on the application reference, it could be on the software, anything related to that, you can go to Nordic and we can help you with all those questions. And we have a team of almost 40 guys and girls in the tech support team that can support you with questions that you have. So I hope that gives you an introduction to how you can utilize the 9160 for asset tracking and that with what we have integrated and what we have done to save power and what we have done on the SDK and documentation side, we have something that enables you to start your development really quickly and uh, we are there to support you if you have any questions to everything that we have covered here today. So then I would uh, hope that you register for upcoming webinars on the Nordic Tech webinar series. We have a lot of interesting coming up.